that sums it up. Okay, I was thinking about how I was going to do this, and I decided that it's a very big topic. Uh, there's a great many related subjects that could be discussed, like uh, things that led up to the war, problems of slavery, reconstruction, uh, all kinds of stuff. But since I don't want to talk for six hours, I decided to limit my presentation to a few narrow considerations, chiefly having to do with how Abraham Lincoln and the events of his times are perceived by people today. It is the impact of Lincoln on a perception of ourselves as a nation that chiefly interests me and I hope will interest you. There is, I believe, a rather large gap between the reality of Abraham Lincoln and, and the common perception of him. It is often true that mythology substitutes for history in our thinking, and the bigger and more powerful the myth, the less likely it is to be grounded in the facts of history. This is especially the case with Lincoln, who is the central figure in American history. <coughs> I call your attention to these two photographs of Lincoln. Everybody see that? Mm -hmm. The image on the left is the standard iconic image of Lincoln. Taken late in the Civil War, it shows us a grave and careworn man, burdened with responsibility, suffering, but resolute. The bearded face subconsciously suggests to our minds the memory of other bearded men who bore tremendous burdens. The Old Testament patriarchs, the prophets, <laughs> Moses the lawgiver, and Jesus himself. This is the image people think of when they think of Lincoln. Lincoln the Great, who saved our nation from dissolution and gave his life for our nation's sins. <coughs> On the right, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> On the right is a less known, well-known photograph of Lincoln taken shortly before he became president. I like this photo without the beard because it gives us a clearer picture of the man's face. It's a more honest Abe, so to speak. <laughs> <laughs> no one looking at this picture would think he was looking at anything more than a typical lawyer politician on the make. <laughs> it is the portrait of an ambitious, conniving, manipulative schemer who would say anything and do anything to get power for himself and his faction. So which is the real Lincoln, the saint or the sinner? I am now going to show you a video put together by the BBC that takes a look at that question. I chose this video out of a number of contenders because I thought it was the most balanced and fair treatment of the question, and it leaves the viewer to draw his own conclusions. It is ironic, although not entirely surprising, that the best documentary about Lincoln should be made by the Brits. <laughs> Unlike Americans who are still fighting the Civil War in a thousand little ways, the Brits have no dog in this fight. They don't care about Abe Lincoln one way or the other. So watch and enjoy, and afterwards I will make a few comments of my own before opening up the meeting for general discussion. All right, what else you got for us, Jerry? All set? Three and a half. Okay. Thank you. There's a country where every morning millions of school children stand at attention with their hands over their hearts and swear in unison an oath of fidelity to the central state and its chief symbol, led by a state-appointed teacher. No, that country is not Nazi Germany and it's not communist Russia either. It's our own country, the good old U.S. of A. I have to tell you guys right now, I hate the Pledge of Allegiance. <laughs> I hate everything about it. One nation under God indivisible, my ass. <laughs> I hate what our country had to become in order for such things to become universal. There was a time, believe it or not, when millions of kids didn't pray to the almighty national state first thing every morning. There was a time when Americans were free to offer their fealty to whatever they wished or to offer it to no one and nothing. Free people don't engage in this sort of totalitarian run. But that time was a long time ago. American history can be divided into two, two broad periods. I call these periods BLT, before Lincoln's tyranny, <laughs> and ALT, after Lincoln's tyranny. Our country was largely one thing before Lincoln, and it has been largely something else since Lincoln. Unfortunately, it, it has become part of the official status narrative that's been imposed on our country to deny this fundamental break, this cleavage in our history. Lincoln's portrait was hung in our classrooms right next to George Washington's. Their birthdays were celebrated as national holidays in close proximity. 
we were encouraged to believe that there was an essential continuity between the two presidencies and a seamless transition between the, the union achieved by the revolutionary generation <coughs> and the union achieved by the policies of the Lincoln administration. So. We were told that Lincoln represents the fulfillment of the promises of the revolution, that it was by his efforts that we were finally able to achieve the kind of society that they had set out to build. This is a gross illusion. There is no continuity between the goals and intentions of the revolutionary generation on the one hand and the goals and intentions of the, of the Lincoln state on the other. George Washington would not have consented to be in the same room with a politician like Abraham Lincoln, <laughs> who was the exact kind of political leader Washington most ardently hoped that the republic would be able to avoid. I am quite sure that if Washington had somehow been able to witness the future events of Lincoln's presidency, that Washington would have gone crawling on his hands and knees back to King George III, <laughs> begging the monarch's forgiveness. <laughs> <laughs> the Lincoln years were truly horrifying. Our nation has yet to acknowledge the full scope of the horror. It is easier to imagine it as a grand pageant of the blues versus the grays, in which everybody eventually won. Forget the destroyed cities, the half million killed, the millions more maimed for life, the destitution of entire states, the gulags for dissenters. It was all for a good cause, we tell ourselves. But the Civil War was an absolute disaster in every way. Aside from the liberation of the slaves, it would be safe to say that nothing good came of the Civil War. But much like our denial of the physical horrors unleashed by the war is our denial of the permanent disfigurement of our national life. The American people today are a people who have lost their liberty. They are serfs on a manor, a manor controlled by one city and operated largely for the benefit of those who run that city, which we ironically call Washington. <laughs> we are stuck in a kind of Orwellian twilight zone, expected to wave the flag and applaud our freedom even as our chains are locked more firmly into place with each passing year. There are a number of factors that make our history difficult for us to see clearly and assess properly. For one thing, tyrant though he was, Lincoln's 19th century tyranny would be dwarfed by the subsequent tyrannies that arose in the 20th. Another factor that tends to blind us to is the limited nature of Lincoln's ambitions. What goals he had, he pursued with a ruthlessness unseen previously in American history. But having achieved those goals through dictatorship and military conquest, he was content to let American society return to a state of relative normality. Unlike the 20th century tyrants, Hitler, Stalin, Mao, Mussolini, Paul Pot, etc., Lincoln had little in the way of grand plans for the complete reconstruction of every aspect of human life in his new empire. But there were others in America who did have such plans, and Lincoln, intentionally or not, was the great enabler of those dreamers with a taste for power. Lincoln removed the constitutional obstacles to politicians with, with utopian ambitions. Because of Lincoln and his war, the Constitution was damaged irreparably, and it has been dying ever since. The Constitution, which was intended to be the guarantee of our rights and liberties, has become the very instrument by which the federal government strips the American people of their rights and liberties. Lincoln is the godfather of the unlimited centralized state. <laughs> now a little bit about the Gettysburg Address. The distortion of our historical perception goes back to Lincoln himself in the form of his campaign speeches and his rhetorical offerings as president. Lincoln offered America an, Im an imaginary history, one that had little relation to reality, but which served his political goals very nicely. While Lincoln did not personally invent the myth of the nation dedicated to a proposition, he did more than anyone else to propagate that myth and impress it upon the American imagination. So successful was he that a better, more balanced, and realistic understanding of our history could hardly get a hearing anymore. We remain a nation dedicated to a proposition to this day, regardless of how utterly destructive that notion has proven itself to be. To illustrate how Lincoln falsified American history, I would like now to take a look at the famous Gettysburg Address, which provides a good insight into the mind of Abraham Lincoln. 
There is a reason that the progressives who run the public school system require little kids to memorize this speech. It provides a complete rationalization for statism and all its works. <coughs> Gettysburg is the Magna Carta of liberal tyranny. And it really is a fine speech. <laughs> Too bad it's bunk from beginning to end. Oh, it starts off well enough, four score and seven <coughs> years ago. Lincoln got the date right, I'll give him that, but it's all downhill from there. <laughs> it, it goes on. Really feel. <laughs> <laughs> it goes on. Our fathers brought forth. This is religious language designed to push the emotional buttons of Christians in the service of a non-Christian agenda. The listener is expected to make some connection between the drafters of the Declaration of Independence and the Old Testament patriarchs such as Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. The drafters are not to be thought of as mere political plotters. No, they are our fathers. And what are our fathers doing? They were bringing forth something new. This is meant to evoke the image of the new birth. This is an image that Christians can always be counted on to fall for. It hits them right in their DNA. If you want to put something over on Christians, just call it a new birth of something or other. Works every time. This pseudo-religious theme is one that Lincoln returns to later in the speech, and it is in fact the thematic glue that holds the Gettysburg Address together. Lincoln wants to save us. But let's stop and take a look at what our fathers allegedly brought forth. Oh look, the bouncing baby boy is a new nation. Except that it wasn't a new nation. The nation, that is, the American people, existed prior to whatever arrangements were made for its governance. It was the same nation after the Revolution as it was before the Revolution, only now it was to have a different government. Lincoln is making the classic progressivist mistake, made by many others many times since, <coughs> of confusing the nation with the government of mm -hmm. the nation. He makes the same mistake again at the end of the address. It's the kind of mistake that a certain kind of mind the Yankee totalitarian mind can't avoid making that the people and the state are one, kind of like Christ and the church. Get it? No, this idea that the founders brought forth the nation is sheer nonsense. What they brought forth, I should say, cobbled together, was a different political regime, nothing more. They certainly did not give birth to our nation. That is just status idolatry at its worst. <clears throat> Back to the Gettysburg Address. What was the nature of this new thing, this new nation allegedly brought forth by our divine patriarchs? Why, it is nothing less than a nation on a mission, just like a church. Because the nation slash church was conceived in liberty, whatever the hell that means, perhaps a vague allusion to the virgin birth, but perhaps, <coughs> but because it was conceived in liberty, you see, that conception gives the nation church its sacred mission, to, get, to dedicate itself forever and ever to the proposition that, quote, all men are created equal. The nation, from its very conception, is on crusade. The nation, that is, the state, is to go marching on forever, trampling out all evil vintages wherever they are found, until perfect equality is achieved. It is here that Lincoln's understanding of American history is at its worst. The signers of the Declaration of Independence envisioned no such mission for America or its government, nor did the framers of the Constitution a few years later. The revolutionary generation did not dedicate the nation to any proposition whatsoever, <coughs> much less to a proposition of equality. That is a gross misreading, and probably a deliberate misreading, of the words of the Declaration of Independence. It is a falsification of history. Half the people who signed the Declaration of Independence, including the guy who wrote most of it, were slave owners. They would have been <laughs> very surprised to hear that they were dedicating the nation or its government to the achievement of equality. All they thought they were doing was divorcing King George III. When today's progressives come upon these facts, their invariable response is to say that the revolutionary leaders didn't quite live up to their own ideals. The truth is, they never had those ideals in the first place. For a good discussion of the actual meaning of the De Declaration of Independence, I refer you to the article I've handed out by Amy Bradford, a former scholar at the University of Dallas. 
In the article, Bradford <coughs> defends the Kendall thesis uh, of Wilmore Kendall, one of the founders of UD. The Kendall thesis is the idea that the Declaration was intended as a bill of divorcement from England, nothing more, and that the phrase, all men are created equal, meant to the revolutionaries, American citizens are just like English citizens, <laughs> and nothing more. Needless to say, it is Lincoln's false understanding of the Declaration that has uh, penetrated the consciousness of most Americans. Hardly surprising, <coughs> given that it is Lincoln's take that is taught in our public schools to the exclusion of all other understandings. One of the advantages of winning wars is that you get to write the subsequent history books <laughs> and make history say whatever you want it to. The rest of the Gettysburg Address goes on in the same painful pseudo-religious vein. The war dead at Gettysburg are not simply victims of Lincoln's own wrong-headedness. No, they are martyrs to a sacred cause that the nation, that is, the government, will not perish from the earth. No, not by a single acre of the territory it controls. It is, to my mind, a great tragedy that such fine words were put into the service of such great obscenity. It is an even greater tragedy that we continue to see our history through the eyes of Abraham Lincoln's secular fanaticism and statist idolatry. Now I would like to look, take a look at some of the features of the modern world that were among the long-term consequences of Mr. Lincoln's war. Not everyone will agree that Lincoln bears the responsibility for these things, and I'm not going to lay out the case that he is because it would be tedious, but such a case can be and has been made by others. Fair-minded persons with an interest in history can and should look it up. To me, it is rather obvious. I'm talking about things that we pretty much take for granted nowadays, but which were either quite rare or utterly unheard of before the Civil War. Such as, one, the concept of total war. That's the idea that you can do whatever the hell you want um, to achieve your military objectives. Uh, there are no rules, basically. You want to massacre citizens by the millions? Go ahead. You know. Cut a swath through Georgia. <laughs> yeah, you want to cut a swath down. Yeah. Kill everything in a 40-mile radius. You know, I'm getting tired of Atlanta. Lincoln <laughs> Atlanta with yeah. the snowstorms. Um, they can't do anything. Let's just burn it. Yeah, Lincoln himself was not, a, a, was not, the guy. A, a, uh, not a genocidal maniac, but some of his generals definitely were. The video <laughs> mentioned General Sherman. <laughs> uh, yeah, General Sherman, too, uh, thought of the Indians much the way he thought of Southerners and, and, and which is that there were subhumans who needed to be exterminated. And Lincoln you know, gave his uh, generals uh, free reign to conduct this uh, near total war. Uh, two, the concept of unconditional surrender. This was uh, something rather new. Civilized people had always allowed their defeated enemies to, to uh, haggle with them over terms. You, know, you, you throw them a bone or two, you know, and not, not totally try to humiliate them. But unconditional surrender is pretty much the norm for warfare these days. The, uh, the defeated have no rights whatsoever. They exist uh, solely at the, uh, the rim of their conquerors. It's uh, something the civilized world hadn't seen since the days of uh, Genghis Khan. <laughs> it's totally barbaric. Uh, number three, the idea that the state embodies the will of the people. Hence, anything the state does is really only the people doing it to themselves. Uh, uh, President Obama referenced this belief a while back when explaining why the federal government could never be a tyranny, regardless, I suppose, of how many tyrannical things it does. It's the people, you see. Number four, the idea that the state itself is the sovereign over the people it rules, not as in the classical liberal construction that the state is the agent of the sovereign people, Rather, the people are the subjects of the sovereign state. They have no right to secede from, or nullify, or resist, or even disagree with the rule of the central state. Hello, totalitarianism. Number five, the idea that all rights and privileges exist at the sufferance of the state and are actually created and destroyed at will by the state. Rights are the result of government action. Ask around and you will find this to be an attitude almost universally held by people today. Why does Jane have a right to kill her baby? Because the Supreme Court says she does. Case closed. Why doesn't Dick have the right to discriminate? Because the government took away that right. Case closed. 
people rarely think beyond that level anymore. Number six, the idea that local units of government are mere administrative units of the central government they have no independent authority of their own, which the central government is obliged to respect. Any and all decisions of local government may be overruled at will by the central government. Why this gets to be de <coughs> called democracy is a mystery to me. <laughs> Seven, the personality cult, the, the persistent cult of personality that now surrounds political figures virtually indistinguishable from the ancient pagan emperor worship. Uh, for instance, we see the images of politicians on coinage. Uh, this is uh, more significant than you may think. Um, back uh, in the early days of the American Republic, you never saw the image of a politician on a coin or, a, or on a bill. No, it was a bill. You saw, yeah, you saw uh, it, images of, you know, Liberty. Symbolic images of liberty, or the eagle, the eagle, yeah, something right. like that. And they Mercury. started doing natives, yeah. right, right. But uh, beginning in 1909, <laughs> we uh, we saw for the first time the image of a politician on our corner. Guess whose image it was? Thank <laughs> you, <laughs> Abe Lincoln on the penny. And we've had nothing but politicians on our coinage and bills ever since. <coughs> um, Come on, we had the second do we had that. <laughs> <laughs> And also, also pretending to cult the personality. Mount Rushmore. What a total obscenity that is. Destruction of beautiful nature. That's right. The Lincoln hey, the Memorial. In there. Is the Bible, right? All the gigantic presidential memorials are disgusting, but Lincoln's is the worst. I don't know. The Washington might be pretty damn ugly. <laughs> yeah, but it's just an obelisk. It's, right. it's, it's, it's just an obelisk. The Lincoln yeah. Memorial is actually a Greek temple. Uh, like Lincoln. Uh, Zeus. And, Link, and Lincoln is Zeus yeah. sitting in that temple. That's true. You know. The, the Washington Monument is just, just showing the rest of the world what a big dick America is. <laughs> 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 oh, you get the point? Nothing right. wrong with that. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Also, uh, let me give you a tip. <laughs> under, under number seven, uh, the cult of the Kennedy family. <laughs> <laughs> Don't even get really? started. You're going to go there? <laughs> Try to get, it, get that in there somehow. Uh, uh, also in the, under this category, the gigantic images of political figures that are a feature of communist countries and other dictatorships. All of this began with the deliberate and systematic deification of Abraham Lincoln by the Republican Party after he was shot in the head. Excuse me, martyred. <laughs> Look into the record of this sometime. It is painful reading. But it began even before Lincoln's death with the identification of the federal war effort with God's purposes and with salvation itself. <coughs> all, all this, uh, his truth is marching on nonsense. <laughs> I wish his truth would quit marching on just for a change. <laughs> and finally, eight. One of the most consequential results of Mr. Lincoln's war has been the complete disappearance from our jurisprudence of the Tenth Amendment or, as I like to call it, the unrepealed elephant in the room amendment. <laughs> the Tenth Amendment is part of the original text of the Constitution ratified by the American people. But our federal judges, including our Supreme Court justices, yes, consistently act as if the Tenth Amendment doesn't <laughs> exist. What's really sad about this is that there was a time, BLT, when the Tenth Amendment was considered the single most important part of the Bill of Rights. Why was it necessary to sweep the tent under the rug? Because it gives the lie to Lincoln's entire enterprise and supports President Buchanan's policy of inaction. The Tenth Amendment requires that questions not addressed by the text of the Constitution are political questions to be decided by political processes, not by legal processes, not by arbitrary actions of the executive, and certainly not by military interventions into civic life. But our current lawless regime can't let this be widely known, or the whole gig is up. So our legal eagles, our best and brightest, maintain a conspiracy of silence concerning, you know, the alleged pachyderm in the so-called room. <laughs> At the moment. Okay, uh, a little bit further, then I'll be done. Uh, I got a little aside on President James Buchanan, the immediate predecessor of President Lincoln. I feel that the man has been much maligned. Typical of the kind of ignorant comments made about Buchanan is the following. He didn't do enough to prevent the Civil War. 
but of course he did. He prevented the Civil War by not starting it. <laughs> a course of action that worked just fine until Abe came along and started it all by himself and on purpose. Buchanan consistently gets ranked near the bottom of lists of presidents, but unjustly so in my opinion. It tells us more about the people doing the ranking than about the man's abilities. Just look at the criteria that are used to measure the greatness of presidents. They are heavily biased in favor of activists with big visions for America and ruthlessness in the pursuit of such visions. Bias against men who simply do a good job of presiding and sticking to the Constitution. Also heavily biased in favor of warmongering imperialists. If that's what makes a good president, then no wonder Abe consistently ends up at the top of the list. I regard James Buchanan as one of our better presidents. This in spite of the fact that he was probably a homosexual. <laughs> 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 This was, true. This, was was widely, this was widely believed around D.C. during his era, and there were good grounds for the belief. Both Buchanan and his, his alleged boyfriend, former Vice President William Rufus King, with whom Buchanan shared an apartment for 10 years, were very effeminate and were always together in public. This did not escape the notice of the local D.C. societal lags, and the duo was widely referred to as Mr. Nancy and Mrs. Fancy. <laughs> Wow, I didn't know we were going to go to this little <laughs> <laughs> I, I, I'm, I'm coming to a point, though. This Buchanan is the president he likes. He either confirmed, <laughs> <laughs> confirmed the rumor nor denied it. And after his death, his family burned all his correspondence with Mr. King. <clears throat> but he has to be regarded as a good president just the same. His methods were to seek compromise, look to make deals acceptable to different sides, <coughs> diffuse passions, and never do anything the Constitution didn't allow him to do. His respect for the law stands up very well next to Lincoln's attitude, which was, I'll respect the law except when it gets in the way of my political goals. <laughs> James Buchanan did what presidents are supposed to do, which is not keep the union together regardless of the cost, but uphold and defend the rule of law. Not force your will upon the entire nation, but seek the consent of the government. You ought to get a little more respect. After all, it wasn't James Buchanan who got half a million Americans killed for nothing. No, that was Abe Lincoln, our greatest president. <laughs> and I got a little side on Jim Crow. <clears throat> While the segregationist policies certainly went a long way towards institutionalizing racist attitudes and were a great burden on black people, racism alone does not explain why Jim Crow happened in the first place. At the end of the Civil War, both North and South were deeply racist societies. But racial segregation gradually disappeared in the North while it increased in the South. The reason was not the moral superiority of the North, however much the Yankee uh, mind might cherish that superstition, but the different experiences of Northerners and Southerners during and after the Civil War. Two things stand out about the Southern experience. One, military occupation, beginning in the early 1860s and not ending completely until the late 1870s. Two, political attempts by the federal government to reconstruct Southern society and to control Southern elections. Both of these were actions of the federal government. Without these two federal actions, there would have been no widespread resentment of free blacks in the South, and therefore no Jim Crow. Government action, rather than racism, was the primary factor that gave rise to a legal regime of apartheid in the Southern United States. The aim of that regime was to check the overwhelming power of the federal government and the Republican Party and to restore home rule. Hatred of arbitrary authority rather than simply a belief in the inferiority of blacks, a belief held by almost all white Americans at that time, explains Jim Crow. Black people were the casualties of that hatred and suffered the brunt of it, and unjustly so, but it is a tragedy that cannot be fully explained without taking into account the actions of the United States government during and immediately after the Civil War. Had there been no invasion, no occupation, and no reconstruction, there would have been no Jim Crow. Other evils, such as involuntary servitude, would likely have persisted at least for a while. But the widespread contempt for and flouting of constitutional law and the poisoning of civil discourse that was Jim Crow would not have happened. 
Like so much that is tragic in the history of the United States, the tragedy of apartheid must ultimately be laid to the account of Abraham Lincoln. It was he, after all, who started the war. It was he who made the complete subjugation of the states his primary political goal. It was his actions that brought the wrathful Republicans to power in Congress. Absent the war, they would have remained an uninfluential minority, dreaming their dreams and envisioning their visions of perfect equality, but without the power to force them on everyone else. That Lincoln personally desired a milder form of reintegration into the Union is ultimately irrelevant. When you break something, such as the Constitution, it is the fact of its being broken that determines subsequent events, not one's personal wishes. Lincoln set the chain of events in motion by sending troops into the states to enforce his will. So the wind reaped the whirlwind. Finally, I have a quote that I found on a blog, one of the wisest things I've ever heard on the subject of the Civil War. And I quote, it's been over a hundred years. When can we talk honestly about what really happened? <laughs> I suspect it won't be until the racial tensions resulting from this inflammatory war have been eased, which has still not happened, not even after all this time. It's worth considering that we granted to Germany generous state rebuilding aid, but that we salted Confederate fields. Now that most Americans are ready to admit that the South was wrong on slavery, when do we stop trying to use the South as a scapegoat for sins that rightfully belong to all Americans? Tragedy always seems to revolve around something noble that is somehow tied to something flawed. The tragedy of the Civil War, that is the reason it remains so deeply compelling to us and so fascinating, may be that the North was right about the evils of, of slavery but wrong about the way they went about fixing it. It works in reverse, too. The South had a noble cause, but chose a very deeply flawed example to make the center of their cause. And that's all I have for tonight. Happy birthday, Abe.